everybody, today's going to be interesting. Today's going to be really interesting. Um, so we were uh, talking um, uh, when when we were um, having our nature journal educator kind of communion to figure out what topics should we do for upcoming months. Um, we started to get into this idea of um, how do we um, how do we how do we make kids care? How do we kind of help kids kind of invest in this? And the topic was so interesting right at that point that it almost diverted the conversation um, from like, what are future topics that we want to have? Like, it was like, let's talk about this now. And oh, here's another thing. Here's another thing. And so I think there's going to be a lot of things for us to, 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 to talk about. But now let's just sort of imagine yourself in front of your family, in front of your, your classroom. And um, your, your students are there and they, um, and we want to show, um, well, the, well, the, the, the idea of kind of, uh, intrinsic motivation, I think is kind of key here. What can we do to kind of get our students to be intrinsically motivated? You can give students an extrinsic motivator, such as this will be graded and you want a good grade. Um, but for this to kind of grow in them and grow beyond you, we want our students to be able to um, to 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 get um, to 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 get it to want it and to go from there. Um, I remember, and I've had um, I've had experiences where I have taken nature journaling and I present I presented it to I was just sort of a quick story. I was on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. And I was doing these workshops in these different schools, kind of going up 395, actually going down 395, heading south. Actually, that's up if you hold the globe the other way. Um, the, and I went to one of the schools that was fairly well resourced. And I did my presentation in there. And the kids in this room, they, they could not be bothered. Like usually what I do is I kind of lead with kind of putting out a bunch of journals on, on, on tables and we start and kids kind of look through those and then people get curious about it. And, and then they're like, oh, wow, this is neat. So they, you know, like, it's a great hook, just kind of dropping a bunch of journals out there and say like, what's going on with this? Why, you know, what am I thinking about? How am I doing it? Why would I be doing this? And do you want to do this too? Um, Usually that's what it takes. That that had no effect on this on this room full of students. Um, and the day following that, I was supposed to do the same program at the continuation school um, there on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. And there were teachers like, "Oh, you're going up there. Oh, you know about those kids. That's going to be rough. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're going to have to go do that." And um, the um, and so I had a little bit of apprehension um, going in with that that lead. So I, I I come up to the school and I've got there are several boxes of of books that I've I've got. So I'm carrying this big box of books of, of journals um, up to the school. And as I'm uh, walking up, a kid um, a, a kid appears who's also walking up to the school, and um, he's sort of like. If Hollywood central casting had sort of invented like the kid in the continuation school, and if this is like if the Hollywood casting person had never been in a continuation school, because like people like this probably just don't exist. I mean, the full mohawk, colored mohawk jacket, leather jacket with spikes on it, you know, like how nature says, do not touch, right? Um, so that kid is walking into the school. And I'm thinking like, oh boy, but the kid gets to the door of the school and it's closed, right? The, not locked, but closed. And he, he stops, he looks back at me and he opens the door for me and says, um, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm 
going to this program. He says, oh, I'm going there too. Do you need help with that? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So he took a bunch of the books off my hands and we, we walk in and, uh, we, um, and, and we, as we walked in, I kind of briefly talked to him about, a little bit about what was going on. And he said, huh, right? And I said, yeah, just take a look through some of these. This is, this is what we're gonna be up to today. And um, so he starts looking through the journals. I go out to get the next box, come back in with it. By the time I get back, he's got all his friends. They're, they're all looking through the journals. They're talking about it. And they, I walk in and they look up and they go like, this is pretty cool. And it was the easiest, best program. I had so much fun. I went back to the school the next day and took them all out on a big field trip, all right? And so they, they totally bought in on it. They got it and were intrinsically motivated to do it. We just had a great, a great program. And every once in a while, like the school administrators would kind of peek in the door and just like, everything okay? Like, oh yeah, yeah, we're good, right? And all the kids are like, you know, sort of shooing them away, like wanting to do more of kind of geeking out with nature journaling. That was interesting, but that's sort of intrinsic motivation. So how do we, um, how can we show relevance? How can we get our kids to, um, to buy in on this? Um, and what are some strategies and ideas to um, talk about? So what I'd love to do is to open this up to our community discussion here and see if anybody has any initial thoughts or ideas that you wanted to share. What does this get you thinking about? I'm gonna bring it to Vea um, and um, no disrespect, but I'm gonna, as you start to talk, I'm gonna run out because I hear a little beeper going off, which means that's my single signal that the pumpkin pie is just about ready to come out of the oven. And I don't want that to burn, no right? So I'm gonna run and get the, rescue the pumpkin pie and I will be right back. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, so I was thinking about this question um, last night and I was thinking about something that Rebecca said a few weeks ago, um, which is that um, the nature journaling is a tool that we use to help people fall in love with nature, but that the real goal is to connect with nature itself. Um, I think that's sort of that's sort of what Rebecca was saying, but either way, I, I really liked what you were saying, Rebecca. So, um, so I was thinking about in a more big sense, how do we get people to care about nature itself? And there's this one friend who I've had for the past 20 years or so, he's my boss back in high school. And we decided to have a conversation about this yesterday because we have done this a lot for the last 20 years. And um, when I first met him, I was the one who was really into nature and it was with an environmental leadership um, job out in the Presidio. And I expected him to be as into nature as I was. And he's like, no, I don't care about nature. I care about the kids. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, you over there with your nature, who cares about that? I care about the kids and like what the kids need and, and where the kids are coming from. And for, for context, we are from um, San Francisco, which, you know, urban inner, inner city youth, all of that stuff. And so yesterday when we were talking about it, he said that what he wants to do is to help kids care about their communities. And that, um, that that's what is what he really, really cares about, especially because a lot of things in our communities, you know, sometimes we have really, really healthy, strong communities and other times we have things that are really, really broken. And so that's what he wants kids to care about. And so I was thinking about this and I thought, well, would the question be different if nature were more a part of our communities? So maybe part of it is getting the nature into the community itself is that maybe if people don't immediately think about nature, maybe it's because there's not enough nature around. I mean, in other cases that may not be the case, but I think in some, it really is. So nature journaling is a tool for that, but then it's almost as though we need to have the nature around first and also a sense of belonging and a sense of, of you know, this is yours, you're safe here. Um, and so trying to think about how to get kids to care about that, I've kind of been watching my own son who happens to be kind of nature reluctant, although now he's really enjoying nature and understanding that it took a long time to build this with him, that I, he couldn't just fall in love immediately. Um, but what helped was getting emotional reactions and do, and helping him find ways of connecting emotionally to nature. So for him, it started really basic with finding things really cute. So, you know, I would say, see, look at the little plant growing up. He's like, oh, look how cute. 
or he would watch little fruit flies flying around the screen. He's like, oh, look, I'm going to call this one Hank. And I'm not going to argue with them. Or even earlier than that, we would watch Animaniacs and there would be the good feathers. And so whenever we'd walk down the street, I'd be like, hey, do you think that that's Squit, Pesto, or Bobby? And he'd be like, I think that's the God Pigeon. And so um, kind of meeting people where they already are and what they already care about and then connecting that to nature. And that's something that Marley, I know, does a lot too. Great. So we've got a couple of things here we can, and we can include them both in our discussion. How do you get people to care about nature journaling? Should they? Um, and how do you get people to care about nature? Right. And you were bringing up um, some really useful thoughts. The idea of that to help people sort of see a meaningful relationship between themselves, the community that they feel a part of, and to help nature be part of that. Um, you also gave us some strategies of, you know, that meet the child where they are. Um, and if your child is into cute and is into naming things, I know there are, are naturalists and educators like, like say, we don't talk about cute, right? But, oh, right? have you ever seen a water bear, right? Um, the, uh, um, and I know that there are people who bristle at the idea of like giving things names because, you know, like the, the, the bird is this, it's this thing out there and it's, you know, when you're naming it, you're sort of injecting all these sort of anthropomorphized stuff into it. Yeah, probably. Um, but I know for my girls, all right, that like that, we, we identify with each other as individuals, right? When you're identifying with something as a species, that's really removed, right? And so, you know, names and things, um, you know, that is, that's a, that's a connection. I mean, that's the reason that people in prison are given numbers because they don't want the guards and others to identify with them as a human being. Um, that's the reason which we give soldiers numbers instead of names is because we don't, the, 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 the person who's going to tell them to run up the hill doesn't want to identify with them as individuals. Um, you're a number and your number is up and it's time for you to start running towards that machine gun nest. And, but the minute things have names, then there is, there's, there's a step closer. Um, I think that that is really, that's really powerful. And I also wanted to add to what you were talking about there with the idea of the importance of in connecting with nature is a direct personal experience. Um, as opposed, and the more that you're removed from that, the less of a connection you're going to feel. Um, that was, there were some really great ideas in there. So I'm gonna encourage everybody as people are talking to be sketch noting away. Um, and so I've already got, uh, I've got little sort of diagrams of connections going here on my page and uh, we'll see what else we can do. Um, Vea, thank you so much for those thoughts and ideas. I'd love to bring Joni in on the conversation. Um, Joni, it's really good to see you. And um, we are going to, whoops. Sorry about that. Um, there. I think what happened is um, Avea and I simultaneously hit the ask to unmute button, which meant that one of us unmuted you and the other one <laughs> put the mute back. Um, so uh, our bad. Hello. Um, just some thoughts I had. Avea, when you were talking about your friend who didn't care about nature, um, some of the things that remind, that made me, what I thought of was that we, we have to remember that we're part of nature. It's not a separate thing. And um, that of course, as we all know, nature's everywhere. It's in your refrigerator, it's in your yard, it's in the garden, it's all those places. And I <clears throat> think it's important. We've, we as a society have begun to think of ourselves as separate from it. 
and we need to let kids know and adults that you know it's all part of us and we are part of it um this is kind of an aside but not but i highly recommend i just got this the other day um it's a series called kinship i don't know if anyone's i see <laughs> rebecca it's five volumes um this is the first volume i'm gonna let's see here And there, the five volumes, the first volume is called Planet. Second volume is Place. Third volume is Partners. Fourth volume is Persons. And the fifth is Practice. And <clears throat> it's all about our human connection with nature and how we need to be, need to value nature as being, having this essence, personhood, that uh, it, has a right to be here just as much as we do and it talks you know goes into all kinds of aspects in society and teaching and actions to take but that's it kind of plays into what we we've, we've been we're starting to talk about too is this new paradigm of remembering we're part of it we're not separate from it and that these all the creatures uh every living thing is um has a right to be here the other thing I just wanted to say was I used to teach. Um, I was a teacher before I retired and for many years. And I would integrate things into my curriculum. And I had, um, I put in birding into my curriculum and was using Project Feeder Watch from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as part of the, what we were doing. And of course, when I first introduced it and said, this is, you know, what we would be doing, the kids were a little like, eh, <laughs> not real interested, but we went out birding. And I, I think it's so important, whether it's children or adults, that you're not going to care about something unless you like it, you love it. And you, as Jack was saying, creating a relationship with it um, and having those experiences, we went out birding one day not, you know for about an hour and they after that it was they were crazy about it they were all bought into the whole what we were going to do we ended up having a booth at our carnival we had handouts about birds and so on and so i mean we took that into various things because they were so interested and i just know no one cares unless you love it unless you have a relationship and have those moments so you have to pretty much get them out it ties in with what jack was saying about you know what he did he got them to buy in and, so. and how do we how do we build that relationship that's going to be that's going to be key um hold on my pumpkin is now um uh calling again um rebecca i see that you've got that that book um um also on your shelf and mm -hmm. um so uh, did you want to kind of expand on that while I go grab my pumpkin? Pie? Um, sure. I, I didn't have very much in specific to say. I was just excited. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I just found out about these books uh, like a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that they were new, but they did just come out this year, this whole series. So got myself a Hanukkah present and um, my family celebrates both. That's not relevant. Anyway, uh, both Christmas and Hanukkah, but more than two things. Anyway. There's an event tonight I just wanted to mention. Um, if you know me at all, you know I'm a really huge fan of Robin Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass. Got to take one of her classes when I was in college, and she's an editor of these books. So if you like those books, then I, you might like these. Um, and so there's an, a, they're doing an event. I think it's through, this is by the Center for Peoples and Nature. And um, there's an event, um, they're doing a virtual book club for each of these books, like I think once a month for the next few months. Mm -hmm. And the authors and contributors are going to be there. So the first one is actually tonight. It's either it's donation based, so like free, or you can pay what you want to. Um, and Robin Kimmer is supposed to be there. So 
um, I'm just really excited about this and this whole idea of um, having a relationship with the natural world and being a part of it in a really deep way that our culture doesn't really usually um, acknowledge. So, you know, like Joni was saying, it's a new idea, but it's also a very old idea to many, many cultures. Um, so yeah, it's called, um, yeah, so it's called Kinship, Belonging in a World of Relations. Um, and so the event is from Center for People in Nature and Point Reyes Bookstore. So um, they already did a virtual event that was like a little panel discussion with Robin Kimmerer and a couple other people. And that was really, really good. I watched the YouTube video of that, so I recommend it. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Thanks. So there's this, uh, you know, the, you know, caring itself is all about relationship. Um, and you think of building that that the relationship that you build with your caregivers, if they are show respect and love of nature, um, there's a lot that kind of just gets built right in on that. Um, so just sort of thinking about care, relationship building. Um, this is this is this is good. I'd like to bring um, Kate in on this as well. Um, Kate, thank you so much for being here with us. Hey, oh, thanks wait, for oh. having me. Okay, so um, I wanted to bring up, since we're talking about books, that's why I ran off <laughs> to get it, was I just, I've been reading this really wonderful book called Remembering Our Intimacies. And it's, um, the under part is Mo'olelo, Aloha Aina, and Ea. And it's by um, Jamaica Osorio, who is a Aloha Aina um, advocate and like social, you know, she does so much. Um, but what it is rooted in is Mo'olelo, which is the Hawaiian term for history um, and story and myth and all of that kind of all tied together. Um, and what's really interesting here in Hawaii is we have this really big hi'iaka, ikapolio pele, like this big epic tale that's been passed down and was recorded in the newspapers um, in Hawaiian language back in the 1800s. And um, it's this repository of just an immense amount of knowledge of um, place-based like nature. So there is like lists, uh, like these chants of the wind names and of the rain names and of going to different places and all those places names and the history of those names that are even you know, like this is like a thousand year old story that developed on all the different islands and was passed back and forth and, you know, through oral storytelling. Um, but it talks about like even older <laughs> stories, you know, and, um, and how each um, like part of the land developed its name. And it's this really neat journey that she takes and she goes up um, and travels up the windward side of all the islands and then comes back on the leeward side. So she visits basically like the whole Paiana, like the whole island chain. And um, and there's stories, so there's stories for like every city and town. <laughs> so it's interesting when you say like, oh, you know, it's like an urban area. And so we're actually like my halal, my Hulu group, we're, we're gonna go into Waikiki, which has just been paved over so much that it was, you know, we had this torrential downpour and <laughs> it was a river. Like, you know, these high-end stores got completely flooded out because of just like, they're just paving it over and all it is is like luxury places. Um, but the idea is that the stories still are a way to remember that, that the land remembers. And this book really talks about how like living, living in a place, we become, we develop this relationship with the place and it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but like, even if it's been paved over and even if we have kind of that sense of disconnection that like we can still reconnect with this place and that reconnecting through story um, and through remembering um, like the, all of those, you know, and I know um, most places don't have, people don't have access to these kind of these like ancient older stories because the kids get like, they just love it. You know, I'm like, okay, 
So the Hiyaka epic and because a lot of them learn about it in school and you're like, okay, she stood right here and she looked out over the same place that we're looking out over. And, you know, even though there's like cars whizzing by and all that sort of stuff and there's pigeons or whatever, you know, you can still tell the same story. You can chant the same chants. And, um, and so that's how, what I've used. Um, I, as I said, like, I know that's not accessible to everybody, but there are a lot of places there are, are still, you know, the, uh, these older stories that you can find. Um, but even just like on a smaller scale, just finding stories of like kind of making it more of a story. So you, we talk about like, okay, here's the Kolea bird and it does this and it flies back and forth and it has, um, and it's known for these sort of um, cultural connections and you know, it's known because it's kind of like, oh, you know, it's like the greedy, <laughs> the greedy bird that comes and eats and then flies away and then comes back and, you know, and so it has kind of these, like the symbolism or the metaphor and kind of connecting it to, the, so that's just like a way that I've really been able to bring people in. Um, I don't know how that, <laughs> that applies for people, you know, like in San Francisco, I mean, I, I, I hope that there's like still, you know, native people and places and, you know, that you can, you can reconnect. Um, but this book just really like changed my whole perspective on when you're thinking about like connecting with nature and it, because it talks about how um, our relationships are one of the one. So, oh yeah, what I was going to say was that, <laughs> sorry, I got kind of totally lost. So this, is, this is good. Totally keep going, keep going. Okay. Um, so one of the things she really talks about is that um, the places that we are together, when you talk about communities, um, the places that we are together, they, they are part of our relationship. So like when you say like, oh, I love this person. I also love, like, I love the place where I met my husband, you know, like, which we, you know, go to regularly, you know, and we can go and we can visit that place. And that place knows us in a way, and it knows our relationship and our connection. And yes, it's like a bar, <laughs> but it is, you know, it's this location. And so it's kind of thinking more about place as, as part of that relationship, not like me having that relationship with place, but place playing a role in my relationship with my husband and with my, my friends and with, with other people as well. That's and that the really place cool. knowing me as well, like I go to the place and then the place learns who I am. And um, so there's this wonderful term, there's two terms, there's kama aina, which is a child of the land, like you're born and raised in the land, and there's kupa aina, which means that the, um, I have become accustomed to this place, like I am a citizen, of, like I have been here long enough that like the land knows me and I know the land. And so there, there's these kind of these different, there's so many different layers of relationship and intimacy that can be created um, using, yeah. <laughs> story and and personal story and ancient story and all these sort of different different ways so that's kind of well and <laughs> that that and that ties in so beautifully with, with what Avea was talking about earlier about um making the you know how do you make nature relevant um you're saying if you know here you're talking about that nature itself is and and the land is physically it, it, it is it is in a very real way part of identity and um that's so different than sort of putting as many walls between yourself and nature as possible that my identity is this you know i am this you know individualistic unit that is you know <clears throat> conquering on my on my own terms um, as opposed to something that came from a place and has roots and responsibilities to that place um, uh, that is uh, such a, a, a powerful and, and different way of of thinking about this let's bring Avea back in because this was was really tying into some themes that you you started us on that I think are are really really powerful I thank just thank you, Kate. You just gave me so many good ideas. So, like what you were saying about how, like for example, you mentioned the place where I met my husband being like the bar, but then that place becomes special to you. So it almost like that gives me this idea that 
we need to make land so it's not just a place where we study, but it's a place where people can make those stories, make new ones, and and have places where you can play in the land. Because then, but but then, like if if you're not so used to being welcomed to the land, then figuring out ways to invite people or figuring out ways to make it accessible to them. So finding those hidden little playgrounds that like are in the middle of Golden Gate Park or something like that, where people can play and then you know say, oh, I was playing and I jumped off the swing and right then I saw a red-tailed hawk zooming overhead. That's something that they'll never forget. Um, or, or, you know, or by the way, this is a place that you can come to to play baseball, or this is a place where you can come to someday if you want to get married or like a graduation party. So making um, those little places, those little nooks really accessible to people, um, especially those who feel like maybe they're not. And what you were saying about, about telling the stories and about how maybe not everybody has the stories of the history. So as nature journal educators, maybe something that would really help us is whenever we're going to be going to a place where we are going to be working with students to have a handful of those stories, at least in the back of our heads. Um, so that way we can include that. Um, so that that way that can give these, you know, kids the more meaning for it, especially if they haven't been taught them in school. So so in advance, maybe our homework is to know our place, to know to know our subject matter, to know some of those stories. Uh, we've been having some really good conversations with, with Rebecca's class about restoriation with that too. And or another thing is that you can invite kids like on the more creative side, something that Rebecca had us do in, in a writing workshop class is to create your own stories of the land. So like, for example, maybe it's, you know, we happened to walk on a hike one day and we happened to see these clips and we were told that they're really exciting because they're made of serpentine and they have a really cool color. So then, well, let's create an origin story. Why is there serpentine here? That's just an example. And like just having your own stories and having your own creativity with it. So like you said, stories are a way of making things a lot more personal with the land. So, so that could be part of what we do too, is helping kids to, um, to have those and there was more you had so many ideas i have to remember what the others were but yeah, yeah, that that <laughs> your your kate your riff there is one of these things i'm going to go back and re-watch i'm happy this is being recorded because um that's uh you were dropping a bunch of deep truth on us and that was that was that was yeah so many different threads in there the, and the, the idea of 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 the place um being having its 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 history and involved in your relationship is really really interesting in a kind of the more that we're in this in in a, in a built environment then the places where significant things happen um, um, in your life then get associated not with a natural feature but with a um, with a, a built thing, um, um, you know, for instance, I, I thought I was gonna get married on top of Mount Tamalpais, but then this giant storm showed up and I got married then in a little inn at the base of the hill. Um, and so I associate that little inn at the base of the hill with that, that intimacy and that transition moment in my life. And um, how would I hold that differently in my head if it had been on top of the mountain? Um, how can we, maybe one thing we, I can do intentionally then is look for opportunities for, um, to be in nature with my children or my students um, at, at kind of key moments. So graduation, we're not going to do it in the, um, in the gymnasium at the school. Graduation, we're gonna do that in the Redwood Forest, right? Um, we're going to, you know, how can I connect kind of, moments to a place intentionally. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to, 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 to think about. Um, uh, uh, Yvette, and then we're gonna bring in Joni. And Kate, I'm gonna keep you uh, here for a little while because I think a lot of things are gonna be tying back into things that you were saying. So um, 
the uh, if you'd feel com uncomfortable with that, we can totally turn off your, your camera. But I think that a bunch of people are going to want to bounce off of ideas that you just uh, sprinkled out there. If you're cool with that. Great. Nivea. In fact, you did. You reminded me of something when you were talking about the city. Um, it reminded me of, of a thing about making memories with the land that we live on and whatnot. And so it made me think about Okay, this is okay. I, I'll use the local example just because it's what I'm familiar with, but I know that, that we're not alone in this. Um, when I think, for example, about the kids from Bayview Hunters Point, which is a neighborhood here in San Francisco, um, there was this one particular year in my high school internship where we went out to Bayview Hunters Point because we were looking for um, a different theme each year of something to, to do for the environment. And so that particular theme we decided on environmental justice. And so we went out to Bayview Hunters Point, and there was a teen our age, 16 who gave us a tour of the land out there, except it wasn't a tour of the land with beautiful stories of origins or of the people who used to live there or of the plants. It was the story about how there was a super fun site buried beneath this neighborhood and more brown fields than you can count. And the way that they were part of an organization called Literacy for Environmental Justice and their founder, this lovely lady named Dana, well, part of why she'd found it is because she used to take her dog for walks every day and her dog would sometimes lick the water that was around the land well her dog got cancer and died from this mm -hmm. and we found out like he, he told us so much history about the way that when when the atomic bomb was dropped it had been disassembled from from new mexico brought over here to bayview hunters point reassembled and then flown away and the way that there had been um testing on nuclear submarine like and nuclear explosions on submarines out in the bikini atoll and the way that those have been brought back here and they had been water blasted hadn't been able to be cleaned and then they'd been sand blasted and so they took the sand that had successfully cleaned off all of this nasty gunk called it black beauty because i guess they had a sense of humor and put it into these drums and sunk them in the bay and it's been leaking out into that community ever since and so we heard so many stories about like the nosebleeds that kids get whether they're inside or outside the way it was blamed on the school cafeteria food the way that they discovered two months later that there was an underground chemical fire from the old military shipyard super fund and it made me think like when you live in an environment like that you might feel like you're the furthest away from nature you can imagine because you don't live in a, in a place that's healthy you live in a dump you live in a place where your people are sick and dying and the city doesn't care but the thing is that because people gradually listened enough there were protests that we wound up having for years and eventually with a lot of fighting they created a place called heron's head park out there which now has a ton of birds that show up because they were able, they didn't clean up everything, but they were able to clean up some of the things and they were able to create an eco center out there. And that was because the community fought and never stopped fighting. And so they didn't have the nature to start with out there, they created it, they found a way to make it happen. And so that's one case where the nature journal can be a very powerful tool. So if the kids live in a place where there isn't nature, have them write about their surroundings anyway and then validate them, especially if they live in a place as traumatizing as that. Because then by validating them, you're listening to them, you're hearing their voice, you're saying, what you're experiencing is real. I see that it's real. The city can gaslight you into thinking that you have to stay silent about this, but there's nothing right about this. And that journal can eventually become a tool for change too. If you get more people listening and more people validating what those kids have to say, then that can be the thing that helps eventually change the environment to something better. I just thought about that when you were talking about the city and about what you can expect to see in the city is that even if we don't live in perfect nature, we should still use our nature journals to write down exactly what we can see and what we have outside of our own homes. And, and so thank you for so and, talk about that. and that very much is that's a connection to the land and a connection to your history. And that's also what Kate was talking about. And that's in this other context. Vea, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Um, let's bring on Joni and then Rebecca. Well, I don't know what to say after that, that so disturbing to think of communities and there are plenty of them around that have had horrible histories. I've just got all kinds of <laughs> thoughts running through my mind when I hear everyone, I'm thinking of ideas when everyone's speaking. This kind of takes us back, but on the whole idea of stories, um, one of the things I think we can do is when we're trying to get kids to buy in, 
to lead them to nature journaling is also tell our stories, um, our experiences that we've had. Because I know, again, back when I was talking about when I was teaching and that group of children, um, I would relate stories, experiences that I'd had in nature and uh, with different species. And interestingly, then as time passed, like one of the students might see a red tailed hawk. And then they would come to me, Miss James, remember when you had that experience that you saw the red tailed hawk and all this stuff went on? I saw one too. So we began connecting our both our stories um, with each other. And kids love stories, adults love stories. So the more we can tell those and share our experiences, I think is a great thing because it also can be put into the nature journal. <clears throat> stories are one of the most powerful ways of, of communicating. Um, if we talk to each other with data, um, our human brains aren't really set up to receive, understand, and, and, and to, to work with that. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll often see politicians who have figured this out. Um, they will use a story of an individual either to mask the data or to highlight the data. Um, so we have to be careful of how we use story. Um, and there are also incredible stories of hope. One of the things which we, as we kind of get into this, one of the things we need to do is to how do we maintain our own hope and power? Because if we become hopeless, um, then we're not going to do the work and then, um, then game over. Um, I'm going to put into the chat um, a source of really beautiful stories of hope. Um, and this is the Goldman Environmental Prize. Um, the Goldman Foundation um, <clears throat> each year um, gives a, uh, an award to one person on each continent um, for what they are doing um to protect the environment and um the stories are there are there are stories of just wisdom and beauty and strength um and as you look through those you will see somebody that looks like you um no matter how you look um there's somebody on every continent every year and uh, they have just an incredible diversity of, 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 of tales and, 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 and bravery and, and beauty. Um, so um, if you are in San Francisco, um, when these are, are live again, you can go, uh, you can get on their, their list to kind of go to these live. It is, it's a beautiful event. Um, and the, also there are recordings of, they make a video of kind of the story of each person and what they're doing. Um, and those are also available on their, their website. So thinking about stories of hope um, and empowerment. Um, the Goldman Environmental Prize is a really beautiful source. I want to encourage people to kind of look through those as well. I'd also we like, have, well, yes. I'm Jonah. just going to say with what you said, I think we have to remember because it's so easy to forget that there are a lot of great success stories in conservation and and all and um we constantly hear the negatives you know these many species lost which we need to hear that but when you hear all these horrible stories and um it can be overwhelming and i'm sure for you know kids these days they just get inundated with negative stories but maybe we need to celebrate the successes too um, and remind them that that is happening. And yeah, the um, just hearing about things are bad and they're getting worse <laughs> um, is, um, you know, that's something that as, as educators and parents, um, that's a really interesting needle to thread. 
um, you don't want to be Pollyanna. Um, you also don't want to be um, uh, but but sort of dwelling in that land um, can also put such a dark cloud over things that people are uh, disincentivized to do anything where it sort of trains us into the sort of state of like things are bad there's nothing you can do about it I'm sorry um, and then then we are helpless because we we believed we are um, that's one reason I, I like so the golden prize winners there's like you know, oh really? You and your your uh, indigenous tribe, you're going to stand up to Shell Oil, to Shell Oil, really? Oh, you did. Oh, you did. Oh, you did, right? <laughs> you know, um, that's 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 powerful. Um, Re Rebecca, would love to have your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, I really liked the things that Kate was saying earlier. Um, I, this is exactly what I'm trying to talk about. I'm, I've been exploring this idea of restoration, restoring the land, but also our relationships to the land, reconnecting to a place through story, reconnecting to each other and to our communities, um, <clears throat> having to me, it's kind of this idea that's like, yes, we can record things in our nature journal, but then also it's, you know, they kind of, our memories become attached to these places and our, our stories of our, our explorations and our adventures so that then when we go outside and go into nature, then we, you know, in our memory, we have all of these stories connected to this place that from both from our personal, our own personal stories, maybe personal stories of, of our teachers, like some of you were saying, uh, family stories and also cultural stories, those kind of myths, you know, so then you're just living in this world that's full of stories that you're a part of and it's part of you. Um, and Ivea made up an awesome, uh, origin myth for the serpentine cliffs, by the way, if <laughs> you guys should ask her to tell it. Um, and I'm trying to remember everything I wanted to say. Um, and yes, to acknowledge that some, um, when things are really bad, like Eva was talking about, um, I think to be able to restore and to heal that the land itself and the connection, but first you have to acknowledge that it's broken. Um, and that's that's part of you know your experience too. And um, you you can't heal what you won't feel. Yeah, that's what Eva said. Um, I feel like there was something else that I wanted to say, but there's one more thing. Um, so, um, I, this, um, you know, we started off with how do we get kids to care? And how do we get students to care about it? And, you know, like talking about career applications or like what are things people interested in? And, but this has gone on like a very, much deeper um, topic, like how do you get people to feel like they're like they like that sense of belonging and a part of a community that I guess it's like how does it care about them before they care about it? Um, and so I think we can piggyback off you know what are kids already interested in, what are the stories that they already love too in a, a more fun way including like pop culture or like what's a um movie or book or something that they like and how do you connect that story to something in nature is another way too but um i just want to i've been wanting to share this um so was it um 
there's a, a Yorkshire Festival of Story that um, Sarah's not here today, but she told me about it. And there, I went to this event, one of the events there virtually <coughs> that was called, <coughs> um, is there ever such a thing as a new story? And I, I just want to share, I was really excited about this because this is a question that I've had in mind. Eva has mentioned it. <coughs> um, because Jack of how you talk about how um, when, you know, when we're trying to learn stuff, the stuff that's already in our brain has precedence. So if we can connect it to something, um, you know, then it'll get pulled in. So this is something that I've, I've been wondering and I asked, I asked a question uh, to this presenter and, uh, you know, people could upvote it, what, what the questions they wanted to be answered. And mine was the most popular and only had a few. So it's not saying very much, but um, this was a question I asked. I know that we learn new things more effectively when they connect to something that's already in our brain. I had an idea that maybe that's why stories help us learn so well, because even if the information is new, the structure of the story is so ingrained into us, so our brain can pull it in. What do you think? And this is what she, this is what she answered. She did a talk about like why people like familiar stories better than new ones, why people have been telling basically the same stories over and over for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, in different retellings. And this is what she said. Um, she said, I love that one. Thank you for that one. There's a term I sometimes use called literary shorthand. A more fancy term for that is probably the archetype. We don't need to think about certain things because we know them so well. So if I were to say to you, you were my fairy godmother, you know what that means. I don't have to give you a literary lesson, but the lessons we can learn from that, it's, um, it's almost like the story is the vehicle and we're attaching the new lesson, the new moral, and we access it, you're quite right, because it is familiar to us. And I think we're more receptive to familiarity as well, whether that's in our daily life or in storytelling, we do intend to gauge, engage more readily. And we trust that which we know. Um, so I was just really excited to kind of hear that response, at least she agrees with my hypothesis. <laughs> Um, oh, and I just, I'm sorry, I've been talking for a really No, 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 you are on a roll. This is, this is gold. You, you go, Rebecca. Go for okay. it. Okay. I just remembered um, the other thing I wanted to say before, which is I really like the idea that you were talking about of getting these kind of like really special, important moments. Like, <clears throat> I guess you could even say like those archetypal moments in our lives, like, um, you know, going into different stages, like weddings, graduations, can we get those moments connected to a place and like the place that we come from that are, we're a part of. Um, I really love that idea, but I also think that it doesn't have to be those big moments, just like all those everyday moments, building a relationship with those places, so the kind of moments that you have over and over again, um, especially when you experience it with other people. Yes. And then, then the people and the place and those those little moments, they all kind of, they, they weave together just sort of when, when you were saying that, I haven't thought about this in years, um, but um, the day that my dad gave me my first pocket knife, he brought me out to his favorite river. And, um, and we spent some time out there and, and he gave me my pocket knife. And uh, it was a, uh, I associate that with that place. I associate it with him and this gesture in the moment. And it was a sort of, you know, for, for the, the little boy that I was, you know, get my first pocket knife was about sort of trust and responsibility and being useful. And we kind of turned into this, 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 this metaphor that it was, I think, intentionally done in that place by the Fall River in California.
this topic is so rich and beautiful. Um, I think we need to go deeper on it. And um, what I think we need to do is either in another workshop, um, I need both you, Kate, and, and you, Rebecca, I need, we, we need to get the, the band back together and just talk about story. Um, and um, that, that would be really rich. And, um, or, or this could be in, um, and if, if you wanna do this, Rebecca, in one of your workshops, because you're, you, you really kind of have created a place where people come to talk about words and language and those sort of things that might be really appropriate in that. I will definitely be showing up in that, but I think that Kate ought to be there too. And we want to kind of just, um, you know, yeah, Kate, rewatch the video of you. You were on fire. Uh, <laughs> um, what do you think about that, Rebecca? Yeah, definitely. We could, we could, we could do both. We have a traveling tour. <laughs> Um, do, do, do you want to host it? In, do you want to host it in one of your workshops? Well, I'm not. Who, maybe we need to talk more about what exactly you have in mind, and okay. uh, they so, wouldn't have seen this, so it wouldn't really be a continuation. That's right. No, it, it would be standalone. Some, it, would, it would be something. totally standalone. I could definitely do something. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yes. Um, so, uh, so uh, Rebecca and I will communicate about this um, uh, off screen. Um, Kate, could I get you to shoot me an email and just say, hi, I'm Kate. <laughs> and then we'll be, we'll be in touch. Um, and before we um, uh, roll out here, I want to also give, um, Clark, I'm sorry, uh, you've had your hand up for quite a while there. And um, the, uh, and I, I um, sorry, we weren't able to get to you. Uh, earlier um That's okay I, I recognize time is is running late and i'm a little nervous about going after your pocket knife story anyway i don't know how I could... <laughs> um i the, you know the place where you started about the group of kids that just weren't into it i mean that just gives me cold chills i i i teach in a very well resourced school uh i've got a an elective next semester with uh, eighth graders um, built around nature journaling on our 180 acre campus. And so I've been thinking a lot about in my time with them and watching young people. Um, and I, I wonder about the demographic, if, if the well-resourced kids, uh, what it is about that demographic. And I think to some degree, when we're talking about hope and bad news, I think for this demographic, the bad news that they're all familiar with punctures the myth of everything's going to be glorious for me forever. And so it's not something that they are interested in, in listening to. Um, uh, they, they are in denial in a way that they realize and don't want to be pulled out of that denial. Um, and I think the way in then has to be, has to be hope. And the way in has to be direct experience. And, and that's the conversation I've been having with my, my colleagues that um, if, if we want them to, to gain ecological literacy, you start with taking them outside and, and you start with that direct, um, that direct exposure. And um, so that's, you know, that's what I'm hoping for for next semester, uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm worried. You know, I'm, I, 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 the thing that I know I've got going for me is that I've got them every day for an entire change of seasons, and uh, we've got an amazing campus, and um, they we will find more than enough to be enthralled and enthusiastic about. Um, but I, I do know that the starting point for them is one of a certain degree of resistance, um, because they are surrounded by bad news that they're trying very hard to shut out. And how, how difficult it must be to be a child growing up under that. I remember when I was a kid, um, I was in, in high school kind of growing up um, under the shadow of the possibility of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And it was just constantly, 
on my, on our minds is what we, we talked about it during lunch, mm -hmm. right? With sitting around with other kids um, instead of you know you know talking about soccer, we talked about nuclear war, um, and um, I wonder how growing up in un, under the shadow of the climate crisis is is also affecting. Um, affecting students. One of the things which we're going to have um, uh, coming up is a workshop that will be about kind of um, a, a, a addressing climate sorts of things with, with, with students and children. And we want to think more about this. So I think that that is something that we should really explore. And also Clark, we will, um, uh, sort of what was partly on the agenda today, but we didn't really go there, was how do you kind of show the relevance of specifically of nature journaling, not so much nature connection. I, will, I think what I'll do is I'll just throw that into a future workshop. So we'll talk more about that um, and how to kind of help students sort of see like, oh yeah, this is relevant and I want in so that they will be like those kids in the continuation school that intrinsically understand like <laughs> thumbs up on this, let's go for it. Um, and um, really hope that you have success with your your students in this 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 coming class. Thank you so much for for being with us here. Um, all right. Um, uh, so in 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 closing out closing out here, um, Kate, I want to thank you again for for sharing with us. Um, that was. Uh, that was really powerful and and generous of you to share those ideas and thoughts with this community. And I'm really grateful. We and, and we want to do more. Um, and uh, I look forward to being in touch. Um, for uh, everybody out there, um, uh, thank you so much for for joining us for this uh, edition of the Nature Journal Educators Forum. Um, the conversations which we seem to have in this, uh, in this community are, I think some of the, the uh, are, are, are so inspiring to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to everybody bringing their A game to these conversations. So thank you all for being here. Um, and um, until next time, um, as, as Clark said, go outside. Take care, everybody. <laughs>